Good morning. It is 9.50 in the morning on Wednesday, the 30th of August. And for this video here, I want to just take a couple of minutes to go over the Mesopotamia information for you. And I'm just going to look at a couple of the Mesopotamian cultures and just kind of walk through uh, what these slides mean. So the very first slide is called the Fertile Crescent. And the Fertile Crescent and Mesopotamia are the same place. And this is a map that kind of shows you where it is. And some of the modern day countries that are located where the Fertile Crescent was are Kuwait, Syria, uh, Lebanon, Jordan, uh, a little bit of Iraq, a little bit of um, the West Bank, Palestinian held territories, and Israel. And this is considered the place where farming starts. There are the two rivers, there's the Tigris River, the Euphrates River, they're fed by snowfall out of the Taurus Mountains of what would be today Turkey. And this is going to be the site where we get our first complex societies as well. This is going to be where uh, the Sumer and Acadia and Babylonia and a bunch of other civilizations are going to grow up. And the first of these civilizations I'm going to mention is ancient Sumer. Now, you might notice this is a nice round number, 3000 to 2000 BC. I'm just trying to make it easy to understand. The dates are a little bit subjective. But ancient Sumer, these are going to be a bunch of independent city-states. It's not a unified country or anything like that in the, the way that we think about it today. Um, these are going to be local locally led cities that have a similar lifestyle and they're going to be led by somebody who is known as an NC or today would be basically the equivalent of a governor. Now we don't know a lot about them. Uh, we're guessing that they were probably elected by the people. Uh, we're pretty sure that the priests helped them because the priests had a very high role in ancient Sumer. And the priests, believe it or not, um, they're not just religious figures. They're going to be the ones that are in charge of farming. They're the ones that tell people what to plant, what to grow, things like that. And the idea is that priests are the ones who talk with or talk to the gods. The writing language of cuneiform is actually going to be created by the priests as a way to keep track of business transactions. All the farmers were expected to bring food into the temple and then as a receipt for this a tablet was going to be taken numbers or whatever put on it and then that would be put into a fire so it would harden and then they would keep it later and speaking of cuneiform um, it's originally going to be for business transactions but eventually it's going to be used for laws and math and writings and everything else and here's some examples of what cuneiform looked like. Now, as we get closer to modern day times, the cuneiform is still used, but it does get simplified and it gets a little bit easier to understand. Sumerian math is something that you use every day. Now, if you're looking at a clock trying to figure out how much longer this class is going to happen or this lecture is going to happen, uh, you're using Sumerian math and that's because Sumerian math was based on the number 60. And we have 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, uh, 24 hours in a day. That's a multiple of 60. Um, math is used in uh, Sumerian numbers all the time. Uh, we also have Sumerian law. I'm not going to read you all of the, the examples, but I'll read you a couple of them. One very famous one says, if a man entered the orchard of another man, it was seized there for stealing, he shall pay 10 shekels of silver. In other words, you caught stealing, you pay for what you stole. Another one, if a man rented an ox and damaged its eye, he shall pay one half of its price. So if you break somebody else's equipment or belongings, you should replace it or pay for it. Another one says, if a man married a wife and she bore him children, and those children are living, 
and his slave also bore children for her master. But the father granted freedom to the slave and her children. The children of the slave shall not divide the estate with the children of the former master. So some of these are actually kind of complicated, which might surprise you that they had complicated and complex law then as well. There's a couple other options and ideas on here, but you kind of get the idea. These laws are very much ethically based. Sumerian Proverbs. Uh, here's just a list of them. Um, a sweet word is everybody's friend. Uh, friend. Friendship lasts a day. Kinship lasts forever. Or another one, a scribe who, whose hand moves as fast as his mouth. That's a scribe for you. So these are very interesting proverbs here too. Uh, Sumerian religion is complicated. And they use their religion as a way to explain the world around them. Uh, Sumerian religion, the gods, uh, there are multiple gods, so they are polytheistic. Um, their gods are seen as in control of natural and physical forces. And their gods, An, Ki, Enlil, Shemesh, they're very much seen as being capricious, meaning that they are going to play with the emotions and toy with the emotions of humans. They're also going to be openly hostile to humans. And when these gods get mad or angry at the people, that's when you get floods and droughts and the failure of crops and things like that. The temples are often in the middle of cities, and there, there are these temples that look like step temples or Mayan temples, if you will, if you've ever seen those. And these temples are called ziggurats. And then at the top of the temples are where the rituals are done to keep on key and Lil Shemesh and others happy. This PowerPoint, I've got an example of Sumerian music. If anybody's interested in this, send me an email and I will give you this updated copy of this. And this is actually kind of an interesting song. You might like it if you're into music. The Sumerians are going to be replaced by the Babylonians. And once again, uh, just easy round numbers, 2000 to 1500. Um, the Babylonians, they were originally going to be known as the Ham uh, Amorites. They were shepherds with wandering flocks. And for whatever reason, they start to move from the mountains of Turkey into Mesopotamia and they take over. Uh, they don't destroy the Sumerian civilization. They just kind of work themselves in and take it over from the inside. And they really just improve on what the Sumerians were already doing. And the changeover from the Sumerian to the Babylonian culture is pretty soft. It's a very soft landing. Now, Babylonian civilization, they preserve all the good things from Sumer. They preserve the engineering techniques, the math, the cuneiform, all of that. But then they add their own touches and they improve it. Uh, for one thing, the Babylonians are much better governed. Uh, instead of warring city-states and unstable empires, uh, Babylon, led by Hammurabi, uh, is going to create a strong, stable empire, probably the largest empire the world had seen up to that point in time. In fact, Hammurabi is going to be best known for his code of laws that becomes known as the Code of Hammurabi. Now the Code of Hammurabi, it applies to everybody. Um, there are a couple of key things that are put in here, like there are instructions on the marriage and divorce. Um, there's a buyer beware clause. Uh, it's the buyer's job to make sure the seller is legit, basically. Um, Debtors are expected to pay through crop sales, and if the crop fails, then the debtor is given a second year to pay off whatever he owes, debt or um, not debt free, but interest free. There's a lot of death and retaliation. It says in here, um, if you're familiar with the eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth idea, that is what's in the laws of Hammurabi. Uh, here's an example of the code. If a man has accused another man and cast against him an accusation of murder and has not proved it against him, his accuser shall be put to death. 
So if I accuse one of you of committing murder and I don't prove my case, if I don't prove that the murderer is actually a murderer, I will be put to death for making a false claim. Another one, if a man strikes the daughter of a free man and causes her to cast that which is within her womb, he shall pay ten shekels of silver for that which is within her womb. If that woman dies as a result, they shall put his daughter to death. That's kind of the idea of where an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth comes from. The Babylonians, they also have proverbs and writings and everything else. Um, the first really big piece of literature that the world has that survives comes from the ancient Babylonians, and that was the Epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh is known as what there is what is known as a poem or an epic poem. An epic poem is going to be a long cultural piece of literature that was originally told from generation to generation. So very much it is a, a uh, spoken document that was eventually written down. Uh, the Babylonians do math and they love science and they love astronomy. Uh, the Babylonians knew and could solve aquatic quadratic formulas. They, they uh, observed a star for 21 years in the tablets of Amasaduga. And what it turns out that they were actually studying was the planet Venus. Now, they didn't necessarily know that, but his, uh, NASA historians have gone through the data, and it turns out that the, the um, observations that the Babylonians kept about Venus were correct. Let me skip through this story here and go straight to the Assyrians. Uh, after the Babylonians, we come to the Assyrians in 1000 to 612 BC. Now, the Assyrians are going to represent the third phase of Mesopotamian history. Uh, they were from northern Mesopotamia, and it's not until 1000 BC that they really start to dominate. Uh, their capital city of Asher was old. And it was in an area that was very open, so they could be invaded from pretty much any direction, and they very much were. Eventually, they grow bitter, and they start to fight back. And then once they can fight back, they're going to go and um, start taking over others. Now, what the Assyrians end up doing is conquering a huge piece of territory, and their civilization is going to stretch from what is modern-day Turkey all the way to modern-day Egypt. And they were not very friendly. They would use terror to try and stop revolts. And when they conquered you, they really had two different ways of doing it. Either you surrendered willingly and they let you keep your leaders, or they just annihilated you. They, they took over by force, they turned you into slaves, and they kicked you out of your own territory. Assyrian warfare uh, is going to consume them. Every piece of their society is based on warfare. Their technology is based on warfare, such as this siege weapon here. All their science is for war. Their war god is going to become their primary god. Their arts about war, literature is about war, foods about war. You get the idea. They're also going to fight using chariots that are very big, big enough to hold four, five, six people. They're going to fight with iron swords, iron tipped spears, they're going to um, you know, be very successful with their warfare style. Now Assyrian laws are very, very strict and their laws are very much based on the idea of warfare. Uh, for example, if a woman has damaged a man's testicle in a quarrel, they shall cut off her finger if she has damaged the second testicle in the quarrel, they shall tear out both her ovaries. So this is like an eye for an eye or a tooth, on, a tooth for a tooth on steroids. Assyrian religion is very much similar to what um, the Sumerian religion was. 
but they take it like a step forward. Um, it's a very negative view of death. They have this, some of the same rituals. Um, the idea basically was if you died, you just sat in a cave for the rest of your life because there's nothing there to light your, your, um, your soul or anything like that. Um, their war god is Asher, who's also their primary god. Um, but then they also have goddess of the earth, goddess of the underworld, goddess of love. Uh, there's like thousands of them, but there's only about 20 or so that are important. And this is an example of an Assyrian temple. This is where the Assyrian god and goddesses lived. And they thought that their gods and goddesses physically and realistically lived there. So in the center of each of these temples is a sealed room that was supposed to be the special chamber for their gods and a place where their gods can rest or look out for whatever's happening or maybe even you know order up a flood. Uh, each temple has a courtyard, a fountain, an altar to burn something and other things as well and they're also doing like drinking celebrations or sprinkling water on people and they're doing ritualistic sacrifice too. Um, Assyrian marriage is very interesting. It's by contract. Basically, uh, in Assyrian marriage, you're not marrying for love. You're not marrying for lust even. You're marrying for financial reasons. Uh, Sumerian death is very harsh. Their, their marriage is harsh. Their death is harsh. And there's, in their afterlife, there's no paradise. There's no special rewards. Uh, everybody's miserable because you don't get to do anything. Eventually, the kingdom of Assyria is going to fall. Uh, the Egyptians will be conquered by Assyria, but eventually they're going to start fighting back, and then others who have a problem with the Assyrians, they start fighting back too. Eventually, the Assyrians will be defeated by Nebuchadnezzar, who is a member of the Chaldean clan. But the Chaldean clan is better known today as the Babylonians, or the New Babylonians. Which brings us to the Chaldeans, or the New Babylonians. Now their date's very specific, 612 BC to 539 BC. We know when their civilization started, we know when it ended. Um, they basically try to undo everything that the Assyrians had. They bring back the old religion, the old way of life. They make the city of Babylon a center of science and learning. But unfortunately, the Chaldeans, they too, fest, um, they too are going to be um, um, I can't even remember what I was going to say. Wow. Um, well, oh yeah, the, the Chaldeans are going to try and undo everything that the, the Assyrians did. And they try to bring back all of the stuff that the original Babylonians did. They bring back the Code of Hammurabi, uh, Marduk. They bring back the temples and ziggurats. And although the Chaldeans, they don't last for very long, they're very wealthy, very powerful, and they serve as a rebirth for the region. So um, that's what happens. Uh, the end of the Chaldeans is kind of sad, though. Um, the people are very distrustful. They don't trust anybody, and it's kind of a miserable life, even though they're wealthy. And for whatever reason, one of the kings of Persia named Cyrus is going to attack Babylon, and there's a food shortage. And the leaders of Babylon, what they decide to do is line up all the women, and they kill ten women and leave one woman alive. That one woman who lives is supposed to bake bread for all the men. So all the women are killed except for a couple of dozen, and that's what's left. Uh, Belshazzar, who's the final king of the, the um, Neo-Babylonians or the, the Chaldeans, um, he's not too worried about his city. In fact, he has put walls around the city, and he thinks that's going to protect him. And when his city is under attack, all he does is sits there, he closes the gates, and he says, okay, um, we'll fight him off from here. What Belshazzar didn't plan on, though, was somebody from the, his own side opening the door and letting all the horses and soldiers in. Uh, eventually, the Chaldeans are going to be completely defeated by the Persian Empire. That's going to be here in the, in the year 539. 
So the Chaldeans are going to be um, no more. They cease to be in 539. All right, I hope this video was nice and short for you. And if you have any questions or if you want to have a copy of this PowerPoint itself, because it is slightly different than what's in Blackboard, just send me an email and I'll send it out to you and um, you know, tell you have a good day. So um, I'll be back shortly with a video on ancient Egypt. And um, once you do that and once you see them both, you'll be done with the lecture for this week and you can move on and you can do your discussion questions and whatever else it is that may be due. All right, thank you very much for joining me. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.